mean to say that to be offensive. But I'm just saying, when you really consider what God has done for you. Praise God. Those first trembling moments in the Pentecostal altar when you, when you were shook up by the presence of God. And you felt something in God you never felt before. And not even that God is predicated to a feeling, but... In response to his word, he even gives you the greatest feeling that you've ever had. That's why you found out, some of you that used to be alcoholics, you found out that alcohol was really just a poor substitute for being intoxicated in the spirit. I'll never forget the first time I got drunk on the Holy Ghost and it wasn't even in a church service. I was listening to a camp meeting tape in the tape deck. And I was about 13 years old, alone in the den, and I started dancing. And, and then I danced a little more. And then it went from feeling awkward to just plain feeling good. <laughs> to, you know, kind of like some of you used to go. And when you caroused and drank and parted and first few drinks, you know, you were a little shy. And the more you drank, well, you were quite the little entertainer. Get up on the table, you do things, and folks will tell you later what you did, and you say, no, I didn't do that. Yeah, you did. We got pictures. Well, I felt that way in the presence of God. And I started staggering around, then I couldn't get up, and I'd try to get up, and I'd start laughing. And I thought, you know, I'd seen my dad drunk many times on peach brandy and Budweiser. Those were his two staple drinks. I don't know if he ever mixed them together, but... I tried to take a drink of peach brandy one time. It was the nastiest stuff I ever tasted. And the thing about the Holy Ghost, it's the sweetest thing you've ever tasted. And it's the sweetest thing you've ever tasted. And when you taste and see how good God is and the feeling that He gives you, and it, it doesn't, it's not accompanied by shame. You don't wake up in the morning with a bad headache. But your heart feels better and your mind is at ease and you got peace that passes all understanding. You have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. People that tie those straps around their arms and stick those old dirty needles in their arms to shoot up heroin and crack and other stuff. It's just a very poor substitute. You know that. I know that. For the power of God that wants to be demonstrated in every life. Amen. Amen. How many is thankful for where God brought you from? Do we have any ex-alcoholics here that know what I'm talking about? Shout hallelujah. Any ex-drug addicts that know what I'm talking about? When you started shooting up Jesus, you didn't have to go back to something else. <laughs> Praise God. And, and th the thing about it in the world is they tell me, I don't know personally, but about every drug addict I've ever interviewed will say, that it's always the best the first time they experienced it. And they're always trying to get back to the first time they experienced the crack of the heroin or whatever it was. Well, the kingdom of God is totally opposite to that. Contradictory to that philosophy. Because you think it feels good the first time you got the Holy Ghost. Go through some pain. Endure some trials. Go through a Red Sea. Go through the wilderness of, of confusion. Go through a few trials and tribulations, even together as a body. And then when you take another drink, it's like, whoa, I've never tasted it like that before. I've never felt it like that before. It's better for me than it's ever been. Praise God. Shout to him one more time. Amen, amen, amen. I, I'm, I'm stirred up in the Holy Ghost today. I feel like God has been talking to me. And I, I, I don't believe in, in just going somewhere to fill a schedule. I, I get plenty of places I could go to fill a schedule. I pray about where I should go, when the calls come, when I should go, the timing of it. And, uh, and I certainly believe that when the Holy Ghost brings a church and a ministry together, and oftentimes... Uh, you know, an evangelist is sit in for reaping purposes. And I've been in those kinds of meetings. Many times God sends a man in in a prophetic sense. He becomes really the echo of things the pastor's already dealt with. That's why you have to be careful to say, well, we've already heard that. But if, if God is sending the mouth of another witness, that means he's really trying to get your attention and tell you something. And really not just tell you something, but for you to apply something to your life 
that you'll put into action, that you'll exercise. Amen. The kingdom of God is not just about Analysis. You cannot just analyze everything God's doing. You have to exercise what he's doing. That's why James said faith without works is dead. I don't want to just hear something and say, well, that boy, that was good preaching. That was a good sermon. Let me put that in my sermon, you know, file cabinet. No, it's for us to absorb what's being said and to exercise. Put it into motion. Put that thing into practice. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so I, I want to activate the things of God. When you look at Luke chapter 5, you remember the paralytic man that the four friends drug through town. They couldn't get through the crowded doorway. So they took him up on the roof. They're ripping tile off the roof. Maybe some of the bystanders nearby looking going, what in the world are they putting a new roof on today for? Jesus is talking. You know, that's distracting. Jesus stops mid-sentence, right in the middle of one of his outstanding parables probably, that has the whole crowd mesmerized, hanging on every word that he's saying. And it's just a bunch of racket. And then here's this man being lowered down into the presence of Jesus. The Bible said there were doctors of law sitting there. Members of the Sanhedrin were there. The scripture says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. It wasn't just talking about the paralytic and the blind. It was in reference to those who were the most intelligent, those who had spent their most time browsing through the holy text. In fact, they had the Torah memorized. And yet, they were too busy inspecting the minister to expect a miracle. They couldn't get beyond analysis. They couldn't get beyond calculating God. That's what makes being an apostolic so exciting because we're not just into analyzing the doctrines and you need to do that you're not just into observing the text and getting it right rightly dividing the word but you're also into exercising that word that i'm not just here to inspect what's going on but i'm here to expect god it's my hope it's my desire it's that that i want to release in the presence of god i want to put my faith into motion so i want to say god i'm not just here to analyze you but i'm here to exercise what you put in me blessed be the name of the lord anybody ever showed you a, uh some of you guys over here look like you lift weights a little bit maybe do a few push-ups <laughs> got a few herculean looking fellows over here could probably lift up a brick or two Anybody ever showed you, though, an exercise or, or a way of doing it that, that you've never done it before? Sometimes when I go into the gym, I'm looking for Mr. Atlas. You know, I'm not looking for the guy that, uh, you know, is level in the middle because the bubble's there. I'm looking for the guy that's had some experience and done this, and he's going to show me an exercise I've never been, done before. I'm not going to go in there thinking, oh, I know how to do this. And you'd be surprised even after years of, of exercising or lifting weights, you might find somebody that does it a little different and, and has a technique that is altogether beneficial to what you're, you're trying to accomplish. The Holy Ghost would like to put something in us today that would cause us to exercise our faith in a dimension that we've never exercised it. It doesn't mean you haven't done great things. It doesn't mean there hasn't been demonstration. It doesn't mean you haven't been a soul winner or taught a Bible study. It just means that God may give you a glimpse of himself today that you haven't seen before or may deal with you in a scripture that you haven't quite thought about like that before. And then you add that to the arsenal of your faith and now you have something to exercise against the devil in a few days that you might think, well, if I didn't get this, I wouldn't have known what to do praise God but God is he's put something into my spirit how many knows that the Holy Ghost ministered through a man of God your pastor or an evangelist or somebody at a conference a camp meeting and you kind of store that away and you think you know there was something in that I really needed and I don't know why I need it yet but I know and then a few days pass and boom a circumstances arises and you realize now I know why God put that scripture into my spirit. Now I know why God equipped me with that message. Because I know how to react to this. And I know how to respond. God's given me something to work with here. 
in Jesus name. Genesis 3 and I I started in this last night and I I felt led of the Holy Ghost to go back to it again today. <clears throat> Genesis 3 and 1 said now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said unto the woman, "Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden you may be seated." I I I walked out of the service last night, and if you weren't here last night, don't worry. You think, well, I'm already behind. You get the tape and catch up later. But I, I went into the office, pastor's office, and I just was waiting on God and listening, and I felt the Holy Ghost speak to him, and he said, you know, a wrong question is God's command in reverse. And you think about it for a moment. Um, Hold your Bible up right here. Just kind of hold it out like this. Just kind of hold it out like this. Now, here I am. Let's, let's say this is your relationship with God. I'm close to God. How many want to be close to God? You're close to God because you've been praying. Now, think about it for a moment. Part of the predicament here with Eve is she's talking to a devil. If you have time to talk to a devil, then you must not be praying. If you have time to listen to a gossiper, you must not be praying. Because if I'm doing this, I don't have time to listen to a snake. If I'm doing this, I don't have time to listen to a snake. If I'm doing this, I don't have time to listen to a snake. If I'm interceding in the presence of God, I don't have time to listen to a snake. Some of you need to say, I don't have time to listen to you, devil. I don't have time for your doubt. I don't have time for the jargon of your unbelief. I don't have time for your demonic cliches. I don't have time for your evil report. I don't have time for your condemnation. I don't have time for your defiling jokes. I don't have time for your humane eccentricities that will pull me away. I don't have time for your philosophy because I'm too busy talking to God. I'll get back to this in just a moment. Hold, get ready to hold that up again. You remember David said, his praise, I will keep continually in my mouth. You ever try to talk to somebody with their mouth full of food? I'm not talking about just a little bit, where because some have the art. You can be talking, over, you can chewing on this side and talking out of this side. <laughs> just having a big old conversation. But, you know, I'm talking about like you just put like a the half the hamburger in your mouth. But but that thought hits them right well. Can't understand them. Hey, you keep your mouth full of the things of God. You don't have time to say anything else. I'm too busy praising. I'm too busy magnifying God. I'm too busy talking about kingdom things. I'm too busy bragging about what God's doing down at the church. I'm too busy talking about who just got saved, not who left. I'm too busy talking about God's miracles, not the misery in my life. I'm too busy talking about the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost, not somebody's problem across town. <laughs> Praise God. So anyway, here we were. God's command in reverse. Now, I'm here. I can see it. I can read this. I don't need glasses right now. And hopefully, I won't ever have to have glasses. I'm just going to keep eating carrots. And... So I can see this. I can, I can read that. Yeah, it says, yeah, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and thou shalt. But here I go. If I'm in reverse, I used to be close to God, and things used to be clear. But as I'm backing up, as I'm going in reverse, I still have my eye on it, but it doesn't make sense to me anymore. <laughs> yeah, some of them doctrines, yeah, some of the, some of the understanding and comprehension that I used to have of, of, of certain principles and discipline in the church, it's not making sense to me anymore. Keep, keep it up right there. Because it's blurred and it's too distant. I know there's words on that page, but now I am, I'm so far removed from it. I have distanced myself from it. So much now, I put things in reverse so much now that I'm now going to have to presume what that page says. Now I'm going to have to make up my own doctrine. That's what backsliders do. That's what people that, 
begin to question things too much begin to do because they put God's command in reverse. Notice the devil said, yea, hath God said. Turn it around, it's yea, God hath said. No, I'm not backing up on what I believe. i got to go forward in faith. I'm not going in reverse, regretting that I ever became a child of God. I'm going forward in trust that He's leading me and taking me to places in the Spirit that I've never been. Glory to God. Glory to God. But here I am. Backing up, backing up. Now I'm making things up. Now I'm confused. Now I'm mad at everybody. And, and because the more I back up, notice when I was here, be seated for a moment. When I was here within the framework of my vision, this was more dominant. Yeah. Think about it. This is more because I'm close to God. And the things in the periphery of my vision are not as distracting. They can distract. And I can look over here distract. And somebody over here start doing that. But I'm focused, see? And it's easier to be focused because I'm close to God. And I don't, I don't miss services just because I'm tired. I go to church because I'm faithful and I want to stay close to God. And I want to keep the framework of His Word the most dominant in my vision. But if I put God's command in reverse, if I'm backing up, if I'm letting what she said get to me, if I'm letting the fact that they got the promotion I was supposed to get, get to me. I got a bill in the mail. I don't know how I'm going to pay that bill. And now it's causing my faith to get a little lax. And I'm backing up. And then I don't pay my tithes. Well, y'all were shouting a minute ago. You know why? Because the, the more I put God's command in reverse, do, do all that stuff. Yeah. See, all, that's not as dominant in my vision anymore. What you're doing becomes more dominant. What the devil is saying becomes more dominant. What the media is reporting becomes more dominant. False doctrines and seducing spirits like the Da Vinci Code becomes more dominant. Well... You know, they got a point with what, no, they don't have a point with what they're saying. That's just fiction out of the pit of hell that people are trying to put into a truth because they don't want to believe the principles of the Word of God. And listen, I got the Da Vinci Code all figured out. You want to find out where the ancestors of Jesus are? You're looking at them because we are the children of Jesus. I've been born again of the water and of the Spirit. Praise God. That's it. That stuff. That stuff. You don't find when David gets ready to go down and knock Goliath on his back that he went down to the Philistine library to figure out how to beat the man. He didn't have to study hours trying to figure out how to defeat Goliath. He just went down there in the name of the Lord with his slingshot he'd been practicing with, already whipped a lion and a bear with it, and he walked down there because in his vision, in his vision, the Word of God was the most dominant. And that's why you don't find David calling Goliath a giant. He doesn't see a giant. He sees an uncircumcised Philistine. He sees a heathen foe of God. He sees an obstruction to the people of God. He sees somebody who is defiant against the laws of God. He's willing to go down there and fight for the honor of his God. But the, the farther I get away from it, these things become more dominant in my vision. What your family members said. Sitting at a table. They hadn't been praying. But the devil's very clever in how to put his words together. And how to question you. And all of a sudden. And, and you know what? We've all been there. You've all been there when you, you were asked a question and you got tongue tied. And you gave the wrong answer. You, you walked away from it going, boy, that was. Whew. Here I thought I was a professor. But I couldn't even talk like an elementary or a kindergartner. And you're just like, man, man, I must not, maybe I don't have what I thought I had. That's the lie. The devil loves to put you on the spot. If Listen, if things are out of focus, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. What does the Holy Ghost do? When I'm praying in the Holy Ghost, it begins to deal with questions I don't know how to answer. 
because it's praying for what I don't know. And so I'm trading all the accumulation of my knowledge again for a place in the spirit I haven't been. And so God is constantly pulling me forward so that I can get focused on something in his word I haven't seen before. But that should be the name of the Lord. So the devil is saying to some of you, you can be seated, the devil is saying to some of you today, Yay, hath God said you're really going to be blessed? Because if you were really going to be blessed, how come A, B, and C is still in your life? And what does it do? It's like, a, it's like a big old gust of wind that knocks you back. The trouble is, is oftentimes we stay back. When the Bible said, rejoice not against me, oh, my enemy, I know I'm going to fall. When I fall, I shall arise. I'm not going to stay in that condition. It's one thing to be a captive. It's another thing to be cooperative. I could take this man right here and say, come here. I could take him and, and bind him up. And say, I'm taking you to my land, and you're going to be a slave in my land. And he could be, you know, kicking the whole way along, because he's a captive, you see. But it's another thing altogether, if you bind me up in chains, and I'm like, man, you don't even have to put no chains on me. And I, I put my arm around, and I'm consorting with the enemy now. See what I'm saying? If I'm, if I'm just cooperative with, with the enemy, well, you don't need to put any chains on me. Some of you listen to me in the Holy Ghost. You've been hit by stuff so many times. After a while, you quit praying for God to help you with that. You quit praying, God, give me deliverance from that. You quit praying for that individual in your life because you say it's, it's, it's hopeless. There's no reason for me to even keep praying about it. Oh, God. I say, devil, you're a liar. I'm not going to cooperate with your interpretation of what's going on in my life. You put chains on me, I'm going to be kicking. I'm going to be... Trying to break out of them chains. I'm going to be trying to get a hold of God. Get me to church. Give me a message. Preach to me, preacher. Pray for me, saint. Get in the middle of my life intercessor. Do something for me, God. I refuse to give in to this feeling. I refuse to give in to this hopeless affair. I refuse to give in to the despair. I refuse to give in to the depression. I refuse to give in to the oppression. I refuse to let the devil possess what belongs to me. Oh, let's magnify him together in Jesus' name. Somebody ought to get up on your feet for a moment and throw up your hands and say, Devil, you're a liar. Stop putting them ungodly questions in my spirit. I'm not going in reverse. I'm going forward. I'm not backing up on my blessing. I am not going to get shy now. I am not going to hide over in some corner now. But I believe that God is doing something in my life. I believe that he's put something in my spirit. And I cannot be satisfied with the curse of the ordinary. I cannot now let my vision get blurred to the blessings of God. I cannot now lose my focus on what the heavenly father is accomplishing in my life and what's the old adage you can be seated out of sight out of mind the longer I keep letting those and notice I didn't say questions I said wrong questions because not every question is wrong if you have a question about things in the word of God and you do it out of a sense of sincerity and, and honest seeking that's not, I'm talking about questions of the world that get in your mind. Worldly philosophies, earthly mindsets, injured faith, wounded trust, betrayed convictions. And then you, and you, and they back you up. And they back you up. Oh God. It's like I said last night. Take the first part of that. It's not a question, it's a quest. I'm not running from something in my life with an escape mentality. I have a discovery mentality. God's laid out clues along this path. Hey, what is that wrapper going to mean? I don't know. Let me put it in my pocket and find out. What, what is that? What is this going to mean? What, let me pick that experience up. What does this, how is this trial going to add to my virtue and my faith? How is that confrontation going to build my character? How is that failure going to give me overcoming faith for the next time I face the, the same temptation? See, I'm accumulating these things because this clue and that hint and that glimpse and that flash 
And that little bit of understanding and line upon line, precept upon precept, I'm going to, the mystery of what God is doing in my life will become clearer and clearer because with every step, I'm getting closer to the rapture trumpet. With every step, I'm getting closer to what He wants me to become. Every step, I'm conforming to the love of God, to the compassion of the cross, to the kindness and the gentleness of the church. I'm leaving behind old abuses. I'm leaving behind anger anger and bitterness. I'm leaving behind immorality and compromise. I'm leaving behind the things that used to get my appetite. And God's purpose for me is becoming more and more focused and clearer the closer I get to it. Let's lift our hands to the Lord for a moment in Jesus' name. I wish somebody would begin to pray. I'm not backing up now. I'm not back. I've watched others in this church get their blessing. I'm not going to quit now. It may be my turn. I may be the one registered in the presence of God to get my miracle. I can't, I can't get distracted now. I can't get detoured now. I'm staying right here. I, I know the path looks a little rugged and bumpy and there's some old jagged limbs sticking out here and there and I'm getting scraped by this circumstance and that one. But I also know that my God of grace, my God who has healed me before, my God who is the guide to to another land. My God has given me promises that the world could never give, much less keep. He's not going to forsake me. He hasn't abandoned the anointing in my life. He has not forsaken the gift that he's put in my life. He has not turned his back on the things that are in me. So I'm going to keep walking and I'm going to keep going forward and I'm going to keep trusting that everything he said he would do in my life, he will bring it to pass. Jesus name Jesus name God have mercy I, I, I feel like there's people right now so be seated for a moment you're in this room and, and prophecies have been spoken over you either by people in the church or the gifts of the spirit or a man of God or even out of prayer you felt something God led you to a scripture how many here would say God has spoken to me about something that hadn't come to pass yet how many have had that thing spoken to you and it's, it's been years? Anybody? Look at this. You don't look discouraged to me unless you're putting on a good front. That doesn't mean you haven't been discouraged. It doesn't mean that you haven't given in from time to time to that fleshly emotion of distress. And you know when you get tired and you haven't slept well and you've tossed and turned in your bed for several nights and you've been working long hours, all these things begin to even look bigger than what they really are. It's the whole molehill becoming the mountain thing. But you're in the service today. And you were praising God a little while ago. Because why? You figured it out. I'm not going to put a question mark on what God has put an exclamation point for. If he said it. <laughs> we just got to keep journeying. Got to keep traveling. I mean, if I'm going from New York to Los Angeles and I get to El Paso, I can't quit journeying because I'm not there yet. I can't get discouraged because I'm not there yet. Keep looking at the signs. That mileage marker is going down. You might just be 10 more miles from your miracle. You might just be a, a few more twists and turns in your trial from a real financial breakthrough. And I know it looks bleak right now. And it looks like you're not going to have enough fuel in your tank of faith to make it. But God is going to add to you every ounce of strength that you need to finish the journey. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, somebody lift him up and tell him, God, I'm not turning back now. I'm not going to start to question what you've already commanded. I'm not going to start doubting what your word has already declared. Shoma <laughs> Jesus' name. I've said it many times. You put your calculator down and you pick up that compass. That compass is the Holy Ghost in you that leads you. Somebody, would, and I was talking with my wife the other day and she said, you know, sometimes you'd like to just hear the thundering voice of God audibly like some of the people in the Old Testament did. I said, we do. Huh? 
Remember Jesus told his disciples that when he would go away and send the comforter, which was the power of the Holy Ghost, he said, I'll bring all things to remembrance what I've said. Sometimes when you're in your darkest moment and you're saying, God, where are you? Talk to me. And he leads you to a verse in the Bible. He just talked to you. He can't speak really any louder. Because he's trying to bring to your remembrance what he said. Or, or you're reminded all of a sudden just out of nowhere. How many knows this is true? You're like, God, I really need an answer to this. And then boom, it's like you remember something that the pastor said six months ago. It's like you weren't even thinking about it. And it, it comes flashing through your mind and you went and dug the tape out. Put it in the tape deck. And if you don't do that, you should do that. And you started writing it down and going, thank you, Lord. You spoke to me because you brought back to my remembrance the things that you've already said. Now my questions are calmed. Now my chaos is settled. Now my panic button is not going to work because I've got peace in what God has already said. That's all Eve had to do. Yeah, he said it. And leave me alone. Sometimes you need a brief answer to your enemy. No. Goodbye. See ya. Don't sit down and have a discussion with him. He's too skilled in his persuasive dialogue. He's a lawyer that's been around on this planet for 6,000 or more years, but at least dealing with fallen man for a long time. He knows every argument. He knows every weakness. He knows every crack and crevice in your reasoning. And if you let him get in there, then you start putting question marks on what God's put periods and exclamation points on. Yes, God hath said. Not has God said. God hath said. My family is going to be saved. God hath said. I'm going to have a financial breakthrough. And you know what I love? I love those people in a service when something like that is said and you've been carrying a promise and yet you're closer to bankruptcy than you are to the blessing, you still get on your feet and shout unto God. Because you refuse to Oh God has talked to you about. Notice the word of God. What's the next verse? Verse number two. And the woman said unto the servant, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall I see you keep on having conversations. In those things you shouldn't even be talking about, you'll start misquoting the facts. You'll start stretching the truth to be something that it's not. It's just like backing away from that Bible. I have to start assuming what it says because I really can't see clearly what it says and my memory seems to be failing failing me. She had spiritual Alzheimer's here for a moment. Next verse. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. This coming from a snake. (laughs) Look, look, Look the next verse. Look at what he says. If God doesn't know that the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. My first question back to the old devil was, have you eaten the fruit? Because look at you. It didn't do much for you. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> uh-huh. Come on, take a drink of this. Yeah, I see what you've been drinking. Look how it's messed up your marriage. No, thank you. Yeah, did you eat that fruit? Or are you just trying to give me advice for something you won't even touch or taste? Praise God. You know what? In the church of the living God, we need less prosecutors and more physicians. Because you can find a prosecutor just about on every corner that will tell you what you're doing wrong and how you need to fix it and this and do right. No, we need physicians walking through the body that know how to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That know how to point somebody to the word of God. That know how to use compassion to change somebody's life. But here, here's the prosecutor. He's got an opinion. 
I said last night in Genesis 1 and 26, God had already told man, I'm going to give you dominion over every beast of the field, over the fowls of the air, over the fish in this. He's over. He is superior to this mocking presence. Why are you bringing yourself down to the level of a liar when truth is already spoken? People won't listen to a liar unless they are at a point in their life where they disagree with the version of truth they've been given. Praise God. Oh, their appetites change. They become hungry for something they shouldn't even have a desire for. Praise God. Man is going to sacrifice dominion for an opinion. This is just the devil's opinion. He doesn't really know. Oh, here I am standing. Up here with God. And I would let something that my family members said bring me down to that level. But it happens, doesn't it? There's people sitting here right now. You've gotten a little, you started to teeter a bit. Because that person that's been influential in your life, they keep hammering at that, that sore, that wound. Next verse. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It may be good for food, but it won't be good for your family. It may be good for food, but it won't be good for your faith. You can experiment with a lot of things in this world and seemingly get by with it. And it may be something that's reasonably good. But in the end, it's not good for your spiritual man. It was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also under her husband with her and he did eat. And can't you just, as you hear the crunch into the fruit and the juice begins to trickle down their, their chins and drip off onto themselves. Oh, that tastes good. Mmm, that's good. Next verse. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew now, you would think, with all this promised knowledge, they're going to come out of this bite with the theory of relativity. Knowing the properties of light. <laughs> knowing how to invent a star, or construct a mountain, or build a planet. Because you're going to be as gods. I mean, come on. You're going, oh. You know, you have somebody, I feel this in the Holy Ghost so strong. You have somebody come up to you and go, let, let me open your eyes to that. Like, like they ain't never had the Holy Ghost. Never talked in tongues. Never even been near a baptismal tank. And then they said, yeah, let, let, let me open your eyes to that. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I want my eyes open to it. You know, or you hear somebody say, yeah, I've had my eyes open. Really? So did Adam and Eve. And you know what they came out of that? Great experiment with. And they knew they were naked. That's the first revelation. I mean, all this grand knowledge, all this wisdom of the universe. And the first thing they figure out is, oh God, I'm naked. I'm shameful. I'm guilty. Because you go ahead and get your eyes open, friend. Because the only thing you're really going to figure out one day is I, 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 I can't do this without God. I, I can't make it without God. I need Him to clothe me with Himself. I need Him to love me with His presence. I need Him to give me that blood sacrifice. I don't even know how to cover myself. Notice, the devil didn't look any different to them. When you go in and look at this word, you study it out through Genesis 3, the devil looked no different to them after they ate the fruit. But God looked different. The God whose presence walked in the cool of the evening and was a comfort to them, now was a stinging conviction that caused them, watch, 
Where are they hiding? They're hiding in the bushes when the Lord, now God, you've put God in a place to start asking questions. See, Genesis 1, it's thou art, because he created man, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. But now in Genesis 3, where art thou? God even asks questions sometimes. When he's blessed you like he has. And then he shows up and goes, where's your faith? Where's your faithfulness? Why do you continue to walk with one foot in the world and one in the church? Why are you not devoted to my word like you used to be? Where art thou? You know where they're hiding? They're hiding in the bush with the devil. Now come on. You got to think about who am I keeping company here? I'm afraid of the presence of God, but I'm not afraid of this snake who just poisoned me and deceived me. God help us today. Let's worship the Lord, church. In the name of Jesus. Somebody pray with me in the Holy Ghost for a moment. Somebody lift up your voice to the Lord. Somebody spark that command of God in your life. My God, my God, my God, help us. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Even in all of that, God, though, was trying to convince them. Here's man hiding from his presence. But after he slays the animal and the skins are there and the blood has spilled to the ground and he covers them with coats of skin, he's trying to tell them, you never have to hide from me. If you come to me and you confess, if you come to me and give me all of those questions, if you come, that's what he was trying to tell them. Eve, if you had questions about the fruit, come to me. If you have questions about where you are in life and you can't figure, come to me. You don't have to hide from me. Hide in me. He is still my refuge. He is, as the young man said earlier, he is my friend. A friend that's taken closer than a brother. He's not just some distant God on a palace balcony holding a scepter to intimidate me. He is a savior with a cross. He is a friend with healing ball. He loves me and he wants to lead me. And he wants to reveal to me things that I don't understand. You don't get mad at your teachers because you don't learn 12 years of knowledge in the first grade. Why are you mad at God? Because He won't show you what you're going through overnight. God's got us all in training for an eternity. And that one moment in eternity, it's all going to be clear. It's all going to be revealed. I'm going to finally understand everything that didn't make sense. Let's stand to our feet and lift our hands to the Lord for a moment in the name of Jesus. God, right now. I would to God somebody would just lift your voice to the Lord. Talk to Him. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. In fact, if you're standing here right now and you feel like God has spoken to you, God has given you promises, and maybe they haven't come to pass yet, but you're not discouraged, you refuse to back down, you refuse to put God's command in reverse, get out and walk down to this front right now. When you get down here, I want you to come praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost, because God's going to add another block onto that building of your faith. God's going to put another piece of lumber into that building, fitly framed together. God's going to open it like a valve, just a little bit more. That which has blocked the lens of your faith. But suddenly you get, you don't may, you may not leave here with complete understanding, but you get a little more understanding. 
That's it, that's it. Kote yalama hando yomo shaha. Hande yalama kosham delama. Oh, I'm not giving up, God. I'm not going to give up. Oh, one more step, one more service, one more prayer. One more magnifying God. One more service of praising the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I feel it. Sunday I'm a yomahaye. Sunday I'm a konde la mahaya. So konde la leke la marondo lo bo sote ya la mahaya. I commando ko sonde leke me ana shahaya. Como sotori ya mahaya ndelehe. Shaye mako ya mataya nde ya la mahaya sheya. Yekaya talala mo sonde la rianda ko ba shahande ya. Shonde la 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 mo konde le li ama sonde le li. Shonde ka ho. In the name of Jesus. You will walk the path that I've chosen for you. You've seen other paths you could take. Some of these paths are paved with great success. But you're looking at a path you've been a little hesitant to take. Because it's like a little narrow trail leading through the mountains. And you have been, haven't quite been sure about taking it. But you're feeling something in the in the core of your being lately that you know God's calling you to take that path it'd be so easy to go the other direction and you'd be successful and you'd still have a testimony Jesus name it's almost like while I'm praying for you here it's like <clears throat> one of them it's like smooth asphalt but when once you've seen it that's that's as good as it gets but this this other trail it's a little hilly it's like cross country but what you can't see on the other side of the first little bit of this path is that it comes into a clearing and it's like these streets it's like they're laid with diamonds and gold and, and I'm not just referring to the golden street in heaven this is I, I'm feeling this in the Holy Ghost here that your real success and even financial prosperity is going to come on the other side of this path that doesn't even look doesn't even look like it's the one I should take in the name of Jesus. Come on, church, let's worship God together.